Hey, it's Dr. Luke Bonham from United Johnny Needle Education. Imagine getting a scary news that you need heart surgery. You need like a multi-level coronary artery bypass graft. You're going to be unconscious on the operating table for like seven hours to get to get multiple vessels in your heart uh, replaced and graft with some new ones. Uh, you survive that surgery. You're like, oh my gosh, I, I lived. And then you wake up and half of your arm doesn't work. How does that even happen? Wake up and your arm doesn't move. <laughs> so this is a really interesting story about a patient, uh, basically a Saturday night palsy from a Thursday morning surgery. Pretty interesting story. Saturday night palsy refers to positional compression of a nerve, that's typically the radial nerve, from prolonged direct pressure on the nerve. What would happen is just like you see in this in this picture here, somebody passes out or they pass out with their arm propped over a table or they pass out with their arm uh, you know, propped over the back of a chair potentially from drinking too much, <laughs> which is why it's called Saturday night, it would cause a prolonged direct pressure on the nerve, and then it would, in, in essence, damage the nerve, and then the patient develops a palsy from that. Now this case is of a, a nerve compression causing an ulnar Saturday night palsy, and it's interesting that the Saturday night palsy occurred from a Thursday morning surgery. Now, I know that if you Google Saturday Night Palsy, we're going to be talking, <laughs> you're going to find that it's talking about the radial nerve. So I'm taking a little bit of artistic, uh, preference here because Saturday night palsy is of the radial nerve, but this is in essence a Saturday night palsy of the ulnar nerve, and it was from a Thursday morning surgery. The following case describes a 73-year-old male with multivessel heart disease. He failed conservative treatments and he required surgical intervention. The surgical intervention he had was a six-vessel, which is known as a, as a six-tuple, cabbage. A cabbage is a coronary artery bypass graft. The surgical procedure lasted over seven hours because it was such an extensive surgery that required so many uh, cabbage grafts to be uh, performed. Upon waking from anesthesia in the ICU, the patient immediately noticed numbness, tingling, weakness, and clumsiness in his left hand. The symptoms were not present before surgery. However, symptoms persisted throughout his hospital course. At the six-week cardiac surgery follow-up, he was referred to outpatient physical therapy with a diagnosis of hand weakness. How do you get hand weakness from heart surgery? In order to understand that, we need to consider the brachial plexus. How many of you remember this from school? And how many of you just had a little bit of a mini panic attack because you couldn't remember it from school? <laughs> so the brachial plexus is made up of, of several different roots. You have C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. You have roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and terminal branches. Uh, one of the ways that you can remember that is, the, and this is what we learned in school. Of course, I was, I was, uh, went to school in the South, so it made a little more sense. But a lot of people remember this from Randy Travis Drinks Cold Beer. Randy Travis was a famous uh, country singer, uh, also known to drink beer. <laughs> so Randy Travis Drinks Cold Beer. You have roots, you have trunks. The trunks are the superior, middle, and the inferior trunk. And then for the drinks, you have anterior and posterior divisions. Uh, and then for the cold in that saying, uh, you have cords, you have a lateral, posterior, and a medial cord. And then for the beer, you have the branches. So lots of different branches. Specifically, what we're going to be looking at for, you know, potentially what happened with this patient is we're going to be looking at the C8-T1 uh, and then the inferior trunk and how that goes into the anterior division, the medial cord, and ultimately into the ulnar branch. And we'll kind of figure out where the patient may have had a little bit of compression and how that occurred during a heart surgery. Here is a closer look of the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus. Remember, it comes from the uh, C8-T1 nerve roots. You see the inferior trunk highlighted blue in this image, and you see it's just right above the uh, clavicle, and it's right above the first rib. Now you have a view of the anterior divisions. Remember, you have the C8-T1 uh, nerve root, and then it goes to the inferior trunk. And then for the Randy Travis, the drinks part, you have the anterior division, a uh, drink for division, and then uh, before it goes into the medial cord and then its terminal branches. You see the anterior division highlighted blue in this image. Now we have an image of the medial cord highlighted blue. Remember from the top, we had the C8-T1 nerve root, and then that went to the inferior trunk, and then we went to the anterior division, and now we're at the medial cord uh, of the brachial plexus, which is, again, the medial cord is highlighted blue in this image. And then lastly in this image, we have the ulnar branch highlighted blue. So again, from the top, we have the C8-T1 nerve root, and then it goes to the inferior trunk. So the C8-T1 was the root, Randy, uh, the inferior trunk, Travis, uh, and then the anterior division is the drinks, and then the medial cord is the cold. And then for the, the beer, which is the ulnar branch, you have the uh, ulnar branch made up from all the way up from that C8-T1 nerve root. Even though we've looked at the brachial plexus, we still haven't answered how could open heart surgery compress the ulnar nerve. Is it the position of the upper extremity during surgery that potentially causes that compression? Or is it something that may be a little more complicated than that? To consider upper extremity positioning during surgery, we look at an older article back in, uh, from 1985. This is an article published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery by Wei and Gwen. 
Uh, the author studied the effect of different arm positions during surgery on the rate of ulnar nerve injury in 35 patients. What they concluded, a significant reduction in the incidence of nerve injury can be affected by placing the forearms above the head rather than at the patient's side. So if you see in the image, you have uh, the arm out straight and then you, you see a little bit of highlighting around uh, the elbow where they're saying that there's ulnar nerve compression in those positions. So to offload that compression, they uh, put the patient's hand on wedges and, and kind of kept them above their head a little bit. Kind of interesting take. Uh, I have some ulnar neuropathy. I have some cubital tunnel. And when my arm goes in that position, my uh, ulnar nerve, it immediately starts singing <laughs> and it just immediately goes to sleep. So this would be a terrible position for me. I was speaking with one of my friends who's an OR nurse uh, who's, who's done, uh, been in, scrubbed in for hundreds and hundreds of cabbages. And I asked him the position that they put the patient in. And they actually do arms down by the side with the uh, arms kind of tucked underneath the patient's buttocks and then they put a big kind of like thoracic roll underneath in between their shoulder blades to kind of open up their chest a little bit. Uh, so that's kind of the position that they're using now. But this study looked at arms overhead and thought that that would be the answer. But is that the only problem to consider when we talk about how you could potentially have a, a palsy or an, a nerve injury from this type of surgery? I don't think that is the only problem to consider. Here's a picture of something that's a little less benign than just the position of the upper extremities during heart surgery. This is a picture of a sternal retractor. A sternal retractor is necessary to perform open heart surgery. The retractors spread the sternum and the ribs apart that allows the surgeon to access the heart to perform the uh, surgical procedure. Good Lord, you can see why this is less benign than the position of the upper extremity. Uh, the surgical retractor uh, is intense. It uh, grabs the sternum after they slice it in half and then it allows the ribs to be spread apart uh, along with the sternum spread apart, which allows access to the heart. Uh, pretty crazy how far that sternal retractor spreads the chest. Here is a second image of a sternal retractor in use and you can see how far apart the chest is spread and how far apart the ribs are spread to allow the surgeons to access the uh, pericardium and do whatever they need to do to, uh, for this heart surgery. This is where it gets interesting and why the sternal retractor may be a little bit of a culprit for uh, creating a nerve injury. Sternal retractors cause the first rib to rotate superiorly, push the clavicle posteriorly, and this can compress the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus, often leading to an ulnar peripheral nerve disorder. Some studies have found up to 18% of cases in coronary artery bypass grafts have some type of ulnar nerve injury when they wake up. Now that we know potentially what the sternal retractor does to the clavicle in the first rib, let's kind of consider where that impacts the brachial plexus. If you look at this image, you see the first rib uh, highlighted blue, and you also see the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus highlighted blue as well. And you can see how the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus can get compressed with the first rib in the clavicle uh, as the chest is spread apart with that sternal retractor. Remember the brachial plexus, the, the inferior portion of the brachial plexus, C8T1, uh, is the nerve root going into the inferior trunk and then the anterior division. So the inferior trunk is where we're looking at the pathology. That inferior trunk goes to the anterior division and it goes to the medial cord and then it makes up the ulnar branch where we get our ulnar nerve palsy. Just as a reminder, when we look at the ulnar nerve motor distribution in the anterior forearm, you got the flexor carpal ulnaris, the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus as well. And then in the hand, you have the hypothenar muscles, which are the palmaris brevis, the abductor digiti minimi, the flexor digiti minimi, and the opponent's digiti minimi. Also, you have your medial two lumbricals, the adductor pollicis, the inner ossia of the hand, and the palmaris brevis as well. So there's a lot of stuff innervated in the distal forearm and the hand by the ulnar nerve. When you consider the sensory distribution of the ulnar nerve, you have the palmar cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve, which innervates the skin on the medial half of the hand. You have the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve, which innervates the skin on the medial one and a half fingers and the associated dorsal hand as well. And then you have the superficial terminal branch of the ulnar nerve, which innervates the palmar surface of the medial one and a half fingers. You can see images on the right side of the screen that demonstrates those uh, sensory innervations and sensory distributions. At initial evaluation, this patient presented with numbness, tingling, pain, and sensory loss throughout the ulnar distribution of the left forearm and the left hand as well. He had weakness in wrist extension, ulnar deviation, the hand and tarasci, and overall grip strength was 50% less in his uninvolved hand. He also had the inability to abduct his fifth digit. Uh, treatment included range of motion activities to improve wrist extension and, and ulnar deviation as well. I did some manual therapy to decrease pain throughout his left upper extremity. Also performed lots of strengthening exercises to the affected muscles of his forearm, his wrist, and his hand. And then, you know, because I'm a hammer and everything's a nail, uh, I did some electrical dry needling to facilitate activation of his hyperthenar muscles. That included his abductor digitum enemy and his opponent's digitum enemy as well. Here's an example of low frequency electrical dry needling with intensity set just above motor threshold to facilitate contraction of his abductor digitum enemy and his opponent's digitum enemy. 
if you remember at initial evaluation, the patient had an inability to abduct his fifth digit. But after a couple of treatments and after some electrical dry needling, uh, we facilitated uh, recruitment. We facilitated contraction. That was a wild one. It's not something you see every day. Uh, have a big heart surgery and then wake up with a uh, ulnar nerve palsy. Uh, fortunately, this patient recovered fairly quickly as, as most... Uh, as most Saturday night palsies, even though it's typically the radial nerve, but as most uh, positional palsies, they, they do tend to get better uh, fairly quickly. Unfortunately, it worked worked out pretty good for this patient as well. The needling definitely helped to get the abductor digitomenomy working again, though, so that was kind of a cool, uh, something that we could use as part of our toolbox uh, to help facilitate some of that muscle recruitment. Uh, this is a really cool case, a weird case. That's why I wanted to share it with you.